Jeff Kelly and myself are going to be kicking off a great event of content where we're going to uh, follow the big data trail of money, and that's kind of our theme for the week. But we have the Cube here, our flagship uh, uh, studio where we broadcast the signal from the noise and interview all the execs, uh, founders, uh, entrepreneurs, and experts in big data uh, in, the, in, in the room next door. But here we're going to um, introduce uh, Jeff Kelly's new research report, and then we're going to follow that with a panel of venture capitalists uh, here in Silicon Valley. We're going to talk about the trends that they're investing in, uh, some of the dynamics in big data. And uh, if you're following the big data industry like us, you know it's dynamic. There's uh, uh, companies going public, companies being bought, companies that may or may not be around in the next uh, uh, couple, couple of years. More importantly, what's happening with the marketplace? Where's the growth and, and, and the key drivers? So we're super excited to, uh, to share this new data with you. Um, I'll be around with, for questions if you have a question after the presentation. I'll have the microphone here. But we see big data as um, really one of the most uh, revolutionary things that have, has come along in, in, this, uh, in the computer industry in generations. And, and really, by itself, it looks great, but when you look at how that intersects with what cloud computing is doing and the advances in infrastructure, it really enables a shift and an inflection point at the same time. You're seeing a lot of wealth creation with startups, you're seeing a lot of disruption uh, that big companies are experiencing that uh, are being disrupted by small startups growing. You see companies like Cloudera announcing $100 million, Hortonworks going public, and a slew of amazing uh, enabling technologies. And so we see you know, a trillion dollar market opportunity in this space when you look at the overall value being created. And it really is something that's special. Uh, someone, someone my age has seen a couple uh, cycles of innovation. This one is probably real special because the creativity, the entrepreneurial uh, action, and more importantly, the big players like IBM, like HP, uh, and others in the industry who've built the computer industry are really participating as well. So we're super excited and we're gonna be covering it uh, like we always do, but tonight is really about what's going on with the research, Jeff Kelly's report, follow the big data money trail, because, you know, as we always say, follow the money, because that's where the action will be in the innovation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Kelly, who's going to uh, introduce his new research. And again, after the presentation, I'll have Jeff up here uh, for a quick fireside chat, and we'll ask, uh, answer any questions that you have. Just raise your hand, and, and we'll bring the mic around to you. So thanks for coming, and uh, stay with us. And if you have any needs for any break, coffee, and so outside next door, you could uh, get some. So thank you very much. Jeff, it's all you. John, thanks very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, as John kind of laid out, uh, we're going to talk today about you know, where's the money and big data going? Where's value being created? And how do we see this market moving forward? So I've only got about 30 minutes. So let's just get right to it. Here are six questions I'm going to try to answer tonight. And these are essentially questions that we get from the Wikibon community in one form or another consistently. So first, what is Wikibon's opinion of where we are in terms of uh, big data market adoption, market revenue, how big is this market? Uh, and what are the enterprises actually yet who are adopting the technology doing with it? Two, what can we learn from previous markets that are more data oriented, that being the BI, business intelligence space, uh, and the data warehouse space? What's the same, what's different about big data related to those two? Um, what about open source? That's a big, a big wild card out there. You know, what is our opinion about open source? How is this driving innovation? Um, and specifically, this is you know, very timely. There was, of course, a, quite a big announcement yesterday around the open data platform um, between companies like Pivotal and IBM and Hortonworks, et cetera. Um, so we'll give uh, our take on that and how we see that potentially uh, impacting the market. Um, next, where's all this money that's being raised? Where's it all going? Kind of back to the main theme. Where's the money going uh, in the big data space? There's Quite a bit of money being raised, have been raised over the last several years, so we'll talk about where that's being invested and why you need that much money in this market. Um, and then what about consolidation? Uh, what does this mean for the market? We've seen consolidation start. We think it's going to expand. We'll talk about that. And finally, is this the beginning of the end of kind of big data? If you're talking about consolidation, does this mean this market's over, we're moving to something else? Or is there uh, you know, a next phase in the big data space? And the answer is there is another phase, and we'll talk about that. So where are we in terms of the big data market? So there's a couple of different ways you can look at it. One, of course, market creation, revenue. Um, Wikibon was the first uh, industry analyst firm to size the big data market. Uh, and basically in 2014, we have uh, determined about $28 billion is, in revenue was uh, created by uh, the supply side uh, in the big data space. And that includes all different areas from 
uh, certainly Hadoop, NoSQL, some of the technologies that get uh, kind of bandied about when you talk about big data, but also the related tools and technologies, whether that's data warehousing, data integration, et cetera. Um, and of course, professional services, which is about 40 plus percent of the market. Um, if you look at the Hadoop and NoSQL slice in particular, um, you're talking about just over a uh, billion dollars in revenue uh, in 2014, um, going into 2015. So if you think about you know, the size of that market, it's a pretty small slice of the overall market, but that's where we see a lot of the innovation happening. Um, now in terms of where it really gets interesting is what are the enterprises out there doing with all this technology? Um, and who are the enterprises that are adopting it? Um, and what we're seeing is a pretty, pretty consistent pattern based on research we've done both quantitative and qualitative. You know, we're seeing on one end of the spectrum, there's certainly the global 1000s, the really big enterprises out there, they are adopting Hadoop uh, and some of the other big data approaches. There's no question about that. Um, the other end of the spectrum are the kind of born data-driven startups. These are companies that have big data kind of built into their DNA. Um, it's just part of what they do. Um, probably Uber is probably the best example of that, but there's a lot, there are quite a few others. Um, but the reality is there's this really a big part of the, the middle of the market, um, enterprises that are not global 1,000, but just you know, a little bit smaller than that, down to the small businesses, uh, where they ha they're exploring big data, they're thinking about it, but really haven't taken too many steps yet moving forward in terms of adopting the technology. So what are those early adopters doing, at least on the enterprise side? <clears throat> what we consistently hear, um, the initial use cases for our technologies like Hadoop has been focused actually on more on the cost saving size side. So concepts you've probably heard of like data warehouse optimization, data warehouse offloading, um, essentially moving data from more expensive systems to a less expensive Hadoop platform, uh, save some money, archive that data, um, and reduce spend on some of these more expensive technologies. Um, the challenge is even with those kinds of deployments, we're seeing enterprises struggling. Um, Hadoop in general is complex, big data is complex, there's a lot of different components involved. It's not a simple monolithic technology. So we're actually seeing even some of the pioneers on the enterprise side working with big data, working with Hadoop that you may have seen on the stage at Hadoop World three or four years ago, you know, they are still struggling in a lot of cases to really expand beyond those pilot projects uh, and kind of move to more production grade deployments that are supporting not just cost savings but you know, more revenue generating applications. Um, and you know, to, to, to that point, when we asked enterprises in the Wikibon community how much revenue, uh, sorry, how much ROI they're getting back from their investment in big data technologies, we heard around 55 cents on the dollar was the average. So that's not great. And frankly, since we uh, did that survey, that was about over a year ago, I say that number's gone down because you've seen adoption increase, struggles continue, and you know, if they're getting 50 cents on the dollar, that's, that's, they're doing pretty well in these early days. So there's a lot of complexity involved, um, and we're seeing most of the use cases, as I said, focused on kind of cost savings uh, and, and less on kind of that revenue generation. So that's kind of where we stand in terms of the market today. Now, what can we learn from previous markets like the business intelligence market, the data warehouse market? What's the same, what's different? So we saw in both those spaces, consolidation happened. You know, in 2007, 2008 timeframe, you saw companies like Business Objects, uh, get acquired by SAP, you saw Cognos get scooped up by IBM, Hyperion get scooped up by Oracle. Um, in the data warehouse space, particularly in the MPP data warehouse space, you saw kind of a, a slew of acquisitions around the 2010, 2011 timeframe, whether it's Nteza, um, Astrodata, uh, Vertica, uh, and, and some others. So, you know, will we see that in the Hadoop space? We think the answer is yes. And in fact, I think you're already starting to see it. Um, you know, there are some differences, of course. Uh, big data comprises a lot more different te technologies than just uh, a specific uh, set of technologies, whether it's BI or data warehousing, but you're already starting to see some acquisitions happening, whether that's in the BI and analytics space as applied to big data, companies like Pentaho getting acquired, uh, Revolution Analytics getting acquired by Microsoft. So you're starting to see that happen, um, but you're also starting to see it in the Hadoop space uh, specifically. So you're seeing companies like Teradata, for example, take some pretty aggressive steps in terms of acquiring companies like Revolitics and Hadapt. So you're already starting to see this uh, consolidation happen, uh, and I think you're going to continue to see that happen. We'll talk a little bit in a minute about why that is. Um, another interesting development in the data warehouse space in particular was kind of the consumption model. So the appliance model, bringing hardware and software together, really became the standard way um, for data warehouse technology to be adopted in the enterprise. And Teradata, again, really kind of led the way on that Oracle with, later with their uh, engineered systems. Now, do we think that's going to happen in the big data space? 
I would say not to the extent that we're going to see a lot of quote unquote appliances, but we're definitely seeing uh, a need for more of a platform approach, tying together these different components into a way that is more consumable for the enterprise. Because right now you've got so many different components in the Hadoop ecosystem, for example, you know, trying to bring that all together as a mainstream enterprise that's somewhat risk averse when it comes to IT investments, you know, that's not how this market's going to expand. There needs to be um, a platform approach. So that's where we see some similarities in these different markets. But there's a wild card here, and that's the open source play. Now, in the business intelligence and data warehouse space, you, know, you did not see uh, open source playing a huge role back in 2007, 2008, uh, through, through 2011 or so. Um, and what's really different is that open source is driving a level of innovation in the big data space that we never saw in those markets. Um, now, just take a step back. Open source software generally is becoming, you know, it's not just being accepted by the enterprise, it's increasingly becoming a requirement. So this is a very different environment um, from those two other two markets that we think um, is going to lead to some, uh, some good outcomes. That, mean, that being, when you see acquisitions in a space, people kind of take a step back and they think, uh oh, the big industry whales are going to uh, adopt, uh, acquire these smaller companies, the ones that are doing the innovation, uh, and the innovation is going to stop. The good news, I think, in this space is because of the open source nature of big data generally, Hadoop specifically, um, the acquisitions are going to happen, but the innovation is going to continue because not only are you going to have new technologies being developed by startups out there that are being well capitalized by venture capitalists, who we'll hear from a little bit later, um, but a lot of the innovation in the big data space is coming from practitioners. So it's coming from companies like Facebook, like Netflix, who are creating these technologies internally and then open sourcing them to the community. And that's going to lead to more startups, commercializing those technologies, and the, uh, the cycle of innovation is going to continue in a way that you might not see in other industries when consolidation happens. Um, now, the open data platform, of course, was, was an announcement that uh, came out recently, um, got a lot of attention. Uh, so you know, just wanted to take a step back and, and kind of address that in particular. And I think you know, the open data platform is interesting, and it's, it's, it plays in with what we see happening in the market, as I mentioned earlier, about the need for a platform approach. We have a standardized uh, core uh, that the enterprise feel comfortable adopting, where they don't have to worry about vendor lock-in as much as they might have to in, in other scenarios. So uh, you know, the open data platform is, in, is a, essentially an industry consortium that's focused on hardening that core for specifically for the enterprise um, and making it easy to build applications on one platform that can run on another, uh, as long as you're part of the open data platform. Now, of course, there's been some criticism, uh, not surprisingly, in this market uh, about this approach. And the question that the open data platform, uh, which includes companies like Pivotal, uh, IBM, Hortonworks, uh, SaaS, and some practitioners as well, General Electric, uh, Verizon, one of the questions I think they do have to answer is what can or what will the open data platform do that the Apache community cannot? Why do we need another industry group um, focused on building out you know, core Hadoop? Um, so what you'll hear from them is that, well, there's fragmentation happening in the open source space. Things like different approaches to SQL on Hadoop, that if you use one, it isn't going to necessarily run on another uh, Hadoop distribution, and that's preventing some enterprises from taking that step, jumping into the pool, if you will, because they don't want to get locked in. We saw that in the kind of the traditional data management space, database space, um, with you know, our friends Oracle kind of being the poster child for that. And the, the concern is that you know, we, we don't want to get into that kind of uh, environment in the big data space. So you know, this is, an, is, a, is a play to kind of alleviate some of those concerns. Now, of course, there's money changing hands you know, to, to be part of the organization. Um, and there's taking some criticism for that, that it's kind of antithetical to the whole open source community uh, approach where really you, you don't need cash, it's all about the code. If you can bring code to the project, that's all, that get, that's all you need to get into the club, if you will. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch that. And I think the, the real barometer of the success or, or, or not of the open data platform is if they keep uh, true to their opening mission, which is to uh, enable enterprise adoption. And then let the players in the open data platform who, you know, are we're all capitalists here, everybody wants to make money, you know, they're going to compete up the stack. And I think that's a good thing generally for the market if they keep their focus on, uh, on, on the core, which is building out Hadoop, making it an accessible platform for the enterprise, and making people feel comfortable to bring it into their, into their organizations. So 
So where's all the money going that's being raised? So just you know, taking a little you know, back of the napkin uh, look at the market in terms of venture capital, um, you know, we're seeing really almost, I would say, crazy amounts of money being raised. So just if you look at the three Hadoop vendors, the three Hadoop pure play vendors alone, uh, MapR, Hortonworks, and Cloudera, together they've raised over $1.6 billion. Um, now, when you, when you bring into uh, the question, as you'll see on this slide, this is, uh, brings into uh, the equation the you NoSQL know, players as well, you're looking at over $2 billion. And then if you look at all the other players that are out on the floor at Hadoop World this week, you know, you're probably talking you know, over $3 billion being raised in this market. So the question, of course, is, well, why do we need this much money to enable this market? Um, software is supposed to be a, you know, not as capital intensive a, a market as the hardware market, for instance. So where's all this money going? Why do you need this much money to build the market? And I think there are a couple reasons for this um, that it's important to understand. So one, it takes time in an open source ecosystem to build the market. Now, that's separate from the innovation. The innovation is happening fast and furious, and I think there's no question about that. You've got practitioners that are innovating. You've got startups that are building new, new technology. So the innovation's happening. But in terms, in terms of actually building um, an enterprise-grade solution platform that's going to you know, be accepted by the mainstream enterprise, it takes time in the open source community. You've got to uh, determine, uh, come to agreement on some kind of standards. You've got to understand uh, the different concerns of the enterprise, which is not always the sweet spot for startup companies that are focused on a, a, an exciting but you know, kind of cutting edge technology. Um, and then just in terms of the, you know, it takes time to build out those distribution channels um, and, and, and the sales channels that the startups don't necessarily have. I mean, startups are really good at innovating. They're really good at inventing stuff. They're not always great at um, taking that, packaging it, and delivering it to the enterprise in a way they can consume it. So I think it takes time, and that's one reason you're seeing all this capital being raised. They need time uh, to build out those channels. Now, the other thing, of course, is that this market is absolutely not confined to the small players, the small startups. Um, you know, you're seeing the big whales in the industry, IBM, HP, EMC, and others are being very aggressive in this market. Um, they see the opportunity. And as a startup, you know, you've got to compete for Mindshare with those companies that have these huge marketing budgets. Um, you know, they, the, their, their marketing machines, when they get them rolling, you know, can be very difficult as a startup to cut through some of that noise and get noticed. So I think you're seeing the need to raise money in that respect to buy some time to build the market, but also to cut through all the noise and, and get your message out there. Now, you know, the, when you think about where the market's going, you know, when it comes to the big players, the question is, you know, when we heard, when this market first started to evolve, people were saying, well, this is going to be very disruptive to the big players out there, um, to the IBMs of the world, the Oracles, et cetera. I would say that that's actually not the case. I think, in fact, the rich are going to get richer. This market is going to be dominated by the big players. And that might not be what everybody wants to hear in the startup community, but ultimately, um, you know, these players are definitely in it for the long haul. There's no question about that. They're spending their money on acquisitions. They, they're, they're spending... Uh, on targeted uh, strategic acquisitions that are going to fill functional gaps um, that are you know, kind of some of the hot new technologies. And what the big whales are really good at is packaging that, delivering that to the enterprise. They have the relationships you know, at the sea level, and they can actually move this forward in a way that those startups can't. So you know, the question or the idea that this is going to completely disrupt the traditional mega vendors, um, you know, I don't think that's the case. I think the traditional mega vendors are going to make a lot of money off this. Um, where does that leave the startups? Well. That's a, that's a good question, and you know, that's, that's kind of the next, next point I wanted to talk about is, you know, what is all this consolidation? What is it going to mean for the market? What's it going to mean for all the startups out there? Um, and as I'm looking at this slide, I didn't mean to make those fish look so mean. It's very, everyone's really happy. It's great. So sorry about that. Don't, don't, don't take that to mean anything. Um, but what does this mean for the market? So again, the idea is that it's going to be very difficult for the startups out there on the floor this week um, to build long-term sustainable business, businesses when you have um, the players like IBM, when players like Pivotal EMC, like Oracle playing uh, such, such a big role. Um, the question is, will there be any independent players left in five or 10 years? I mean, I'd like to get your, your opinion. How many people out there think out of the startups out there that are on the floor this week, in five, 10 years from now, there's gonna be a billion dollar company left standing that's kind of an independent player? Just one. Not too many hands went out there. Um, you know, my opinion is I think there will be one, maybe two. 
Um, you know, I think probably the two companies best positioned right now to be those companies are Cloudera and Hortonworks. They got, they got off to an early start. Um, you know, they have laid the foundation for uh, this entire market, really. Um, you know, a few slides ago, I showed the kind of the Hadoop slice of the, the larger market. Um, and it's not huge compared to the rest of the big data space, but that's where we're seeing a lot of the innovation. Um, and they're laying the, the kind of the foundation for this. Um, other companies like Map are as well. So, you know, I think there will be a couple, one, maybe two of those companies that remain five years from now that are maybe a billion dollar company. I think that's definitely possible. But a lot of those players out there, uh, the smaller startups that are focused on what I might call a, a particular tool or a sub-segment of the larger big data stack, now, they're going to get acquired, some of those companies. They're going to have good exits, and a lot of them are not. I mean, part of this is just the natural evolution of a, of a new market, right? I mean, there's, as a venture capitalist, you, you place your bets, you know that only a couple are going to pay off, and most of them aren't. That's just the way it works, and that's, and that's okay. Um, and that's not to say that the innovation that these companies are creating is not important. So it's not to say that the tools and the technologies they're developing are not important, but this goes back to an earlier point where it's got to fit in with the larger uh, platform approach that mainstream enterprises require. Um, you know, just talking to a lot of enterprise practitioners, they talk about, you know, they get the value of big data at a high level. But when it comes to practically implementing it, you know, they don't want to be in the business of cobbling together various components to, you know, enable this kind of uh, innovation around analytics, around data-driven applications. That's not their skill set. Um, and frankly, there just, there's just aren't the skills in the larger enterprises, um, even, even some of the global 1000s, to do that. Uh, that's not necessarily the business they want to be in. And you know, the other thing is a platform approach also helps from a governance and compliance perspective. Um, you know, when you cobble different things together, it gets more difficult to kind of track things like data lineage and um, you know, how people are using the different components within the stack. So you know, what really is required is this platform approach. And as a standalone company focusing on just one tool, it's going to be challenging to kind of build a, a long-term sustainable business, in our opinion, uh, in this kind of world where platform is going to rule. Um, and, you know, the other thing you've got to keep in mind is it's not just the tools need to fit into the big data stack. Big data itself needs to fit into the larger infrastructure, the larger data management landscape within you know, a, a mature enterprise. So, you know, and then if you take even a step back from that, you know, that needs to fit into the larger uh, infrastructure and some of the innovation that's happening in the cloud space that John talked about earlier. Now, how those come together, you know, is going to require some, some really, um, s s some significant innovation and some significant changes in the way enterprises uh, look at procuring IT, procuring uh, data management technologies, procuring infrastructure. So, it, again, it's going to be challenging, I think, for some of those smaller companies uh, to kind of live on as independent entities when they're focused on a slice of the, of, of the stack, which is certainly important. Um, you know, there's a lot more out there and a lot more that has to go into consideration when you're thinking about big data as a platform. So finally, is, the, uh, is this the beginning of the end uh, you know, of the big data space? You know, when there's acquisitions, people think, okay, well, that means that's the end of the innovation, and now the big whales are going to package that up and try to sell it at you know, mass scale and make a lot of money off this. And in some cases, the enterprise customers are going to be happy about that. There'll be some good outcomes. In some cases, there aren't. Um, so is that, the, is that the scenario that we're looking at here in the big data space is the question. Um, I would say that's not the case for a couple of reasons uh, and a couple of points that I, I've already touched on. Um, I think what's going to happen in the next phase of big data, a few different things. One, you're going to see enterprises are going to get more mature about um, not just the technology and bringing it into their environments, but some of the other more process-centric, more um, non-technology challenges associated with big data. That's mainly around data governance, compliance, um, you know, ethics, more of the process and people issues and political issues. I think you're going to start to see that maturation happen. Um, you know, from an innovation standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, the good news is because of the open source underpinnings of this market, um, I don't think the, the innovation is going to stop when you start to see acquisitions. Uh, in fact, it, it could accelerate as the market actually expands in terms of enterprises adopting the technology because in some cases, it's the practitioners themselves that are innovating, creating new tools, creating new technologies, and then open sourcing those for the community. Because increasingly, for those companies, they're not competing on, the, the technology itself is not what gives them the competitive advantage, it's how they're applying it. So for a company like Facebook, for a company like Netflix, 
And they're quite happy to open source some of the new innovations they're doing because they, they have other components, the way they use the technology, their um, unique data assets that they have that are, they're, they're using in conjunctions with those approaches. That's what gives them their differentiation, not necessarily the tool. So I do think the innovation is going to continue thanks to kind of that open source foundation of the big data space. Um, and finally, you know, I think the real, where, where it gets really interesting is, you know, moving from, as I talked about at the opening, some of the early use cases we've seen in this space have been around cost savings. How can I uh, save some money on my data warehouse? I've got, you know, my IT budget is flat, my, you know, my data volumes are growing exponentially, something's got to give. Well, Hadoop comes in and it's, a, it's, it's good low-hanging fruit. You know, we can move some of that, those workloads, some of that data to a Hadoop environment, we're going to save a lot of money. Um, fantastic, and then that makes sense from a, uh, from, it's very easy from an ROI perspective to, to, to put those numbers on a spreadsheet and see how, how, the, how the numbers add up. Um, but where it gets interesting is where you start talking about using all that data that now you're filling into your so-called data lake, and maybe the original purpose was to offload uh, more expensive workloads, but now you can build data-driven applications that are actually going to focus on revenue generation. Um, or they might focus on cost savings and efficiency, but not in an IT sense. So things like what you're seeing with GE and some of the more industrial companies focusing on predictive maintenance, those kind of use cases, where you're actually, you know, a, a very small improvement in efficiency can really impact the bottom line. So, and in other cases, you've got applications that are focusing on customer data, understanding your customer data better, understanding what drives them, and understanding how to interact with them that's going to, you know, provide them value uh, by putting offers for goods and services in front of them that's going to resonate with them and that's going to impact re revenue. So uh, I think the next phase of this is moving more to those, uh, those types of workloads. In addition, it's not just kind of the batch-oriented first generation of Hadoop. Uh, it's going to be more, more and more around real time, more and more around near real time, and uh, the Internet of Things. I mean, I think clearly when you look at the amount of data being created by um, essentially objects that previously did not create data, there's so much opportunity there and so much innovation that's going to happen in that space. I think that's where you're going to see some of the real excitement moving from, hey, we're going to save some money by moving some of our data warehouse workloads over to Hadoop to what am I going to do with all this data that's now being generated through um, whether it's industrial equipment, whether it's you know, sensors on, um, on trucks, on fleets of airplanes, on uh, wearables, whatever the case might be. I think that's where the real opportunity is going to be, and that's ultimately where the value is going to be. And you're going to see the, the big data, uh, sorry, the, the mega vendors who are doing some of these acquisitions, you're going to see them competing in that space, moving up the stack to the applications, to the analytics, because that's where the real money is going to be made from a vendor standpoint. And then if you look at in terms of the value you're going to be created by the enterprise practitioners, I think that's going to dwarf that. I mean, if you, what I've got on screen here is some, some research we did, uh, David Floyer, our CTO, and I did around the industrial internet. Um, you know, we're looking at about a half a billion, uh, half a trillion dollars in revenue generated through the uh, industrial internet, which is just a component of the IoT. But if you look at the, the red bar there, you know, over 1.2 trillion in terms of value created by the practitioners. And, you know, we said this in New York at our Big Data NYC show, and I think it's worth repeating here. We think the big winners in big data are going to be the practitioners who are putting the technology to use to create new lines of business, to create new streams of revenue, to reinvent markets. So, that's kind of how we see the market today. It's, it's a fun market to watch. Obviously, there's a lot happening in this space. Uh, this week's going to be fun to watch what's going on at the show. Um, I encourage you all to kind of tune in to uh, the Cube, SiliconAngle.tv, and we'll be covering all the action. Uh, but thanks for your time, and thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. Okay, Jeff. Now I get to ask the tough questions. Oh Come boy. on. That was great. Great presentation. How about another hand for Jeff Kelly? All right. Great. Here, grab a seat here. Okay. All right. Before we bring the, uh, the VCs out who will give a great perspective on, on the investment cycle, which is a great barometer, in my opinion, of the innovation, which even though there's some consolidation being talked about here from the research, there's not uh, a stall in innovation, at least from an anecdotal observational stand, standpoint. But we did, I did get some Twitter action on, uh, while, during your presentation, and I'll start off with that question, and then we'll open it up to, to questions in the audience. I'm sure you have some. I'll just kick it off. Um, the question came from someone on Twitter. Maybe I shouldn't say their name, but where do you think the traditional enterprise is heading? IoT, newer databases, reporting for big data. Mm -hmm. You kind of mentioned that on your last slide. But the context of the question was interesting. It was from a recruiter who's actually dealing with Rift employees from the big whales. So the you know, IBMs, the HPs, the EMCs, they're downsizing, it's in the news. So they're shrinking their employee mm -hmm. base, but yet they're going into new markets. So 
this brings up an interesting question. There's a trillion dollars of wealth creation, um, but the big whales are also becoming leaner. Are they just mm -hmm. too fat, or are they trying to slim down? Are they not positioned for the opportunity? What's your advice to the people out there that are being riffed or and laid off, if you will, from the big companies or looking for a new career change? Well, I think you know, from the perspective of, of somebody working uh, for one of those big companies in their old lines of business, I would say you've got to be, a, you know, get your resume ready because frankly, you're seeing these big companies that are going through the transition from, and it's not just big data, I think you've got to take a larger, you've got to step back and take a larger view and it's around, in a lot of cases, the cloud is actually driving a lot, of, a lot of those challenges. So IBM making that transition, SAP making that transition. And you know, profit margins are smaller, uh, you know, they're, they're lower in guidance on when they're going to be profitable on their cloud services. So they're in this transition phase, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, in terms of you know, those big companies, I still think they are well, well positioned if they can navigate this transition um, you know, with all the shareholder uh, pressure they're going to get in the short term. If they can navigate this transition, there's a huge opportunity for those companies. And as, a, as, a, as a, an employee, if I'm, if I'm you know, working for one of those companies, I'm looking for opportunities on that side of the business because you're seeing companies, um, you know, some of the big whales, they are, they're, they're laying off people on, this, on the old, old world side of the business, but simultaneously they are hiring like crazy on the big data and cloud spaces and mobile and application development spaces. So that's where I would be looking um, if you're in kind of one of those old line sides of the business. I mean, there's definitely a transition going on and there's going to be, it's going to be painful for some people, but when you come out the other side, I think there's going to be a lot of value creation. Yeah, we certainly hear from the big guys that they're retooling to go after those new opportunities. So another question came in. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We have a mic, but I'll just go with another one here uh, that came in off our crowd chat. It says, where's all that money being raised going? You know, billion dollars being raised from some companies. Yeah. I thought software was supposed to be capital efficient. Yeah. Why are they raising all the money? Where's it going? <laughs> You know what's what's happening. Well, so yeah. what, what are they spending was, the money I was, on? I was, you know, touching that in the presentation. I think, um, as I said, this market is because you've got the big the big industry whales that are, are participating in this market. You know, if you're a startup, you need to raise a lot of money to uh, fight that kind of the marketing battle. Number one, um, and but you need time to build the market. The market's taking time to develop. It's not happening. The 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 the, the market itself is not developing as fast as the innovation. It's not keeping up with the level of innovation. So there's tons of innovation out there, but it's not as consumable to the enterprise right now. So that's the challenge, is to turn that innovation into something that the enterprise can consume, and that's going to take a little bit of time when you throw in all the complexities of an open source ecosystem, um, just open source generally. So you know, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot that has to happen to build the market, um, not necessarily the innovation that's happening at a, at a much higher pace. Any questions out there? We have a question right here. Um, Mike in the front, because we're recording, so we want to just capture the, the question on the, uh, the live stream, thanks. Yeah, hi Jeff. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the methodology you use mm -hmm. to derive the, the ROI, the 1.2 trillion mm -hmm. of uh, return versus 500 million, if I mm -hmm. read it correctly, mm -hmm. of investment? Yeah, so you know, when, we, when we look at the market, we talk about, you know, we, when we talk to, the, to the, the vendor side, you know, they are pretty clear about um, you know, that they are making significant investments in this. And, and we think from a revenue perspective, you know, that's a pretty traditional measure that we can, we can, we can look at. In terms of, you know, where the, where the value creation is going to happen, um, if you look at past markets and the level of, of innovation, the le level of value that's been created compared to the revenue, um, you know, you, you, I think you have to increase it when you look at this market because you've got things like the open source underpinnings, you've got things like new data sources coming online and the level of innovation that's happening. So um, I think you have to look at it, you know, there's some, certainly some more traditional ways we, we, can, we can model the market, but you have to look at some of the new kind of wild card, which is open source, which I think really kind of shakes things up. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because, I mean, frankly, I think that could be a low number. I think there could be a lot more value generated because ultimately once, you, once the platform is developed, once the tooling is uh, hardened, um, you know, the, the, the capabilities of, of, a, of an enterprise that's invested in the skills internally to, to develop those kind of applications, I think could be endless. So, and frankly, I think we, under, I think we underestimated that to some extent, um, but it'll be interesting to watch. Okay, uh, another question in the back there. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit about the hardware innovation? Where's the money going? Is mm -hmm. it commodity hardware good enough or? Do you well, see any money go going yeah, down? I think interesting. The hardware side is interesting because you're seeing so you're seeing com from you're seeing companies like uh, EMC, for example, uh, you know, the on the storage side, uh, trying to play in this market and applying some of their capabilities 
to Hadoop in the data lake, for example. Um, so I think there's some possibility there that that could gain some traction. I think but what's really interesting is what's happening with players that are focusing more on uh, making big data, making Hadoop more cloud-like, uh, enabling companies to very quickly spin up new clusters within their private cloud. Uh, a lot of this isn't going to go to the public cloud right now. So you're seeing companies that are focused, like Blue Data is an example of a company that's uh, helping, uh, trying to help companies make it much easier, making it much turnkey to press a button, spin up a cluster, to, to lower that barrier to entry and, and significantly decrease the time to insight. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can also comment on that from just from uh, the data that I've been seeing uh, through, through our research on the Silicon Angle side is that the hardware stuff is really aggressive. And I said earlier on the intro that the intersection of uh, converged infrastructure is really a hot area. So if you look at cloud, uh, converged infrastructure, and big data, and then in big data you stuff in social, meet, social, mobile, and apps in big data, that's kind of where I, st where I stick that. The converged infrastructure stuff is booming. Flash, for example, is awesome. In memory, uh, silicon-based analytics is going to be a trend we think we're going to see a lot of. So I think you're going to see a, a huge innovation at the hardware layer where you're going to see purpose-built boxes, that may not be a good word, but I think you're going to see solutions where the customers really don't care as long as it is super fast. And mm -hmm. the data is so massive, whether you're a financial services company or whatever, low latency data transfer will be a, a key area. So from our standpoint, that's kind of a new area that we see coming out of the pure standalone server uh, kind of market. So I think that converge infrastructure uh, or hyper-converge or whatever the buzzword is these days is a, is a key trend. Thank you. Question over there. Hey, John. Um, on the practitioner side, so mm -hmm. the value creation, do you have a view of use cases in that practitioner area mm -hmm. um, beyond you know, cheap storage? But. Yeah, so I think you know, the first place people are looking beyond kind of that, you know, yeah. the offloading of more expensive workloads, um, I mean, the most obvious thing is customer data. And getting, a, getting that complete view of your customer is, is top of mind for, for many companies, because this is not a new challenge. People have been trying to, to get at this for years. Um, and you know, the, the EDW market and the BI market has been touting this, you know, get a 360 degree view of your customer for a long time now. Um, but in reality, the, those markets really didn't live up to that promise. So I think that's one area where you're starting to see um, applications being built because people understand that that ultimately um, is how you're going to drive revenues. You understand your customer, you've got to personalize the experience. And this is obviously more important in consumer facing enterprises, retail for example. Um, but you've got to provide your customers a level of personalization that they've come to expect from using applications like Facebook or, or, or LinkedIn, for example. So uh, I think that's one area, customer analytics, understanding the life cycle of a customer and understanding what should I offer that customer next uh, to upsell that customer. So that's one area. Um, you know, the other thing is around, I think I alluded to this, was around predictive maintenance in the industrial space. Um, you know, so for companies that are not necessarily as consumer focused, but are more manufacturing focused or industrial in nature, um, you know, the idea of improving efficiencies by, um, you know, Fixing a problem in a piece of industrial equipment before it shuts the piece of equipment down, for example, can save a lot of money. So if you think about a, you know, an aircraft engine, you know, doing routine maintenance on that when, uh, you know, before the, the engine has a major failure. Uh, it's, it's also good for safety, by the way. You don't want to be on that plane when that happens. So uh, that's another one, predictive maintenance, you're going to see, uh, I think, a lot of innovation in that. GE's one company, but others, Siemens, uh, United Technologies, all these companies are focused on collecting all that data coming off their machines, their equipment, uh, and figuring out how they can use that to improve service levels for their, for their customers. The, the other trend we see on the uh, practitioner side that's hot right now is obviously the insight side of the equation, which is where you could just see data-driven insight could come from any place in the organization. People use the money ball example all the time for years now, but literally it could come from anyone in the organization that the data-driven insight where there's innovation specifically could come from either the visualization side, an R programmer, or anyone within the organization. But the data is the lever for the innovation, so that could come from anyone in the organization. So I think that that's the practitioner trend that we see is the ease of use and the, and the, and the visualization is hot right now, but that's leading towards that the data-driven value is going to come from you know, a lot of places. Uh, uh, we have time for like two more questions. So, yeah, well, what is your take on this uh, ridiculous open uh, data platform? <laughs> Why uh, Pivotal suddenly open, open up their complete stack? And do you consider Cloud Foundry is a success or failure? Cloud Foundry? Or is that what the, was you say, Cloud Foundry? Okay. 
Uh, well, I have an opinion on that. Yeah, I think John has a couple of thoughts on that. But uh, from Cloud Foundry's perspective, I think you know it was, it's pretty astonishing the level of growth they've had in just you know less than a year. Um, and I think that is the model. I think if you ask uh, the team at Pivotal, that 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 in many ways is the model for the open data platform. Um, look, I think I think the open data platform, if it again, if it focuses on the the end result, which is enabling enterprise adoption. And if it delivers value to customers, I think it's it, it's it's a fine and uh, worthwhile um, organization. But you know that said, you know there's certainly I think it, it needs to prove itself, and it has to show that it's going to be able to do something that the Apache community can't do. Um, we'll see if that it remains to be seen if that's going to happen. Early. It, I mean, yeah, it was just announced. We'll see. I mean, you have to you have to hold them to their to their uh, to their promises, but it, that's going to take time to I see mean, how I that plays out. I have an opinion out. on this. I mean, I've always been a naysayer of uh, industry consortium, so I kind of agree with Mike Olson on this point. He kind of wrote a blog post at Cloudera on that. But I think you know, in the interviews that we had on the cube and just. I've been proven wrong. OpenStack came out on the cloud side. I was kind of like, oh, that's cool. And then it became kind of like this marketing program. And then what happened was the organization actually morphed and actually became more code driven and actually has done some good work. Uh, cloud Foundry, I was kind of skeptical at the beginning because they were cobbling together a bunch of open source concepts and projects, but they delivered. And then this one seems to follow that same trajectory. To me, I think we're in a new era and it's, the time is to, to, to see because the, the, the open source is a first class citizen now. So what's happening is, the movement and the shaping of these projects is going to come down to the value. And I think IBM and the big players that are involved in open data platform are serious and they're going after this market and they have a lot to lose. Like I said, they are trimming their workforces down. They're trying to be leaner. So, you know, I think it's a serious move and I think we just have to watch it. But again, I was skeptical of OpenStack and Cloud Foundry and, you know, I kind of had to fall on my sword on that one because they've delivered. They've delivered revenue and value. Now, some might not like it, but if the market's growing to be a trillion, you know, it's, it has to provide value. So I think we're in a new era now where you're going to see the transparency there and it's going to be a choice mm -hmm. game. So as long as there's no lock-in spec for interoperability, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add to that, I think, I think it's, it's a good thing. If they address the pain points that enterprises are, are currently facing in terms of adop adopting Hadoop, things like uh, things around governance, things around, you know, taking more of a platform approach so you don't have to stitch these things together, um, things like, uh, avoiding that vendor lock-in question, whether the real or imagined, it's, it's an issue. Um, if they do those things, and the other thing I think is important to watch as that organization grows, ODP grows, is uh, enterprise practitioners join the, the organization, not just the vendor side. If you start to see that, those two things, they focus on, on the real pain points of the enterprise, and you actually see enterprises getting involved in the organization. Um, to me, that would be a sign that you know, they're keeping the eye on, uh, on the ball. Well, to me, the red flag on that, it's the quick acid test for me is, is if it's a marketing program, then it's probably going to fail. I mean, we've seen that in other generations. So again, OpenStack had that moment, if you're not familiar with OpenStack, where it's kind of a marketing program. And then it morphed very quickly where the code itself and the benchmarks were all out in the open, and it worked. It worked, it, it still worked. So, uh, Is, is successful. If you look at a private pass market, only Netflix, in terms of Netflix, there are lots of pass applications on AWS, is successful. There are very few pass applications are successful. If you look at a Docker, that cloud, they went to Docker only. They are very focused on niche. And if you look at the cloud bees, they are only focused on Jenkins. So there is no very successful pass startup right now. I would what do you agree think? with that. I would agree with that. I think pass is the battleground. I think, to me, it's it's a commoditization and scale issue. I think Amazon has been super successful because they control the pass. They're really good. Amazon is is an amazing platform, and I think they're a key disrupt disruptor in the enterprise, and they're not even enterprise cloud. So Amazon is the gold standard, in my opinion, of cloud. And But they're not as strong on the enterprise, but they're winning. They just, they're winning in the government side. So I think everyone in the industry, in my opinion, that I've talked to has said, either to me privately or publicly, Amazon is really awesome. But Amazon in its past has got some proprietariness to it. But if it works, do people care, right? To me, that's again, coming down to the interoperability piece. Can I get it out? Can I move it around? If data has to move around, that's another question. So. Um, Okay, we've got one last question. Great, great questions. Hey, Jeff. Um, what needs to happen for enterprise adoption mm -hmm. to speed up, to accelerate? And are we looking at a long road or a short road? Well, I think, I think the appetite for the enterprise is strong, so, which is one reason why I think you're going to see some consolidation, because I don't think that the, the <laughs> fractured startup ecosystem can, can meet that demand. But what it's, what it's going to take, um, in my opinion, 
is you know, this, is all, this market has always been very driven around um, partnerships and integration. Because as I said, big data is not a single thing. Hadoop, sometimes people equate that Hadoop is big data, but it's just one part of it. And then it, even if you look within Hadoop, there's a lot of different moving parts. So I think one thing that's going to have to happen is there, have, there has to be, and this goes to the point of what ODP is trying to do, is develop some standards, and, and, and not just standards, but, but harden that in, into a package, essentially, that, that the enterprise, you know, the, the slightly more risk uh, averse enterprises beyond those that have kind of taken those first steps, the, the, the global 1000, um, will they feel comfortable bringing into their organization knowing that they don't necessarily have the internal skills to, to, to cobble it together like some of the early adopters did. So that's one thing. Um, the other big challenge I think that's holding people back is the security and governance question. Um, I think it gets, doesn't get talked about enough. I think w what I've heard from a lot of practitioners, early adopters, is they've built out, they've adopted Hadoop, they have some great ideas for some new applications, built out these prototypes, somewhat successful, and ready to roll these out into production, and then you get the compliance department involved, you get legal involved, and like, well, you, you, you can't do that. You guys didn't think about it. Now you're mingling data that was never meant to live together before. Um, you know, you've got, you know, in the U.S., it's very siloed in terms of regulations, you know, it's whether it's uh, HIPAA and healthcare, Sarbanes-Oxley and finance and some others, where in Europe, you have tend to have more uh, data protection, data security, and governance compliance rules that kind of span industries. Uh, but in either case, you know, when you get to that point where you want to start doing some interesting things with big data, you, if you hadn't thought about the governance, com governance implications as you were building out the application, um, that can stop it you know, dead in its tracks. So I think the other thing that has to happen is there has to be better awareness on the enterprise side about these issues. Um, you know, you're seeing things like you know, the, the vendor community trying to talk about it a little bit more with the data governance initiative launched a few weeks ago. Uh, but I think the enterprise has to have a, a, a bigger conversation around governance and security and what this means now that you can do all these things that big data enables. Um, not everything it enables is legal. <laughs> and even when it's not necessarily illegal or, or breaking some rule, um, there are ethical considerations whether maybe you don't, just because big, big data allows you to do something, doesn't necessarily mean you, you should do it. Um, so I think those are two areas that I think would that need to be addressed before we start to see really uh, adoption really speed up. These are great questions, and, and one of the things that we're seeing is there's demand on the enterprise side, and we're covering this and on SiliconAngle.com, Wikibon.org, and uh, the Cube. So you know we're we're documenting, and these are the questions: there's demand on the enterprise side, there's some uncertainties, but people are retooling because of mobile and the advantages and the economics. Uh, and the business values there. So the platform as a service is a battleground. Amazon's making their way into the enterprise. All this stuff is forcing all this amazing change. And I think the opportunities for the startups will be there. I personally think there's a billion dollar startups out there. Cloudera is technically a billion dollar valuation already, um, Jeff. And so, you know, it, I think it's exciting. I think a lot of them will die, but I hope that, you know, most of them get acquired. But there's a ton of opportunity. Um, let's give Jeff Kelly a great round of applause. We're going to have to bring the VCs up now.